Hello and welcome to No Filter, a Nintendo podcast. I'm your host, Wizrad, and this is episode one, December 1st, 2017. No Filter, a Nintendo podcast is a podcast all about gaming, particularly Nintendo, and uh, hopefully my fresh take on the gaming scene. Again, I've been I've been I've been gaming for pretty much my entire life. Uh, I started in the N64 days, and here I am now. Um, some some of you guys might know me from my past uh, content that I was creating, but this No Filter and Nintendo podcast is something new, something fresh, and I hope uh, you guys can all appreciate it. Right now, with episode one and for the next few, um, this is all getting started just with my YouTube channel, No Filter and Nintendo Podcast. You can also follow me on Twitter at Wizrad, or if you have any questions for me or any comments you want to bring up, uh, my email at nofilter underscore wizrad at hotmail.com. Okay, done with the plugs. So I want to get into what my intentions are for this podcast, just very quickly here. So I feel like the gaming scene nowadays... Um, with the Nintendo Switch out and PS4 and the Xbox One and how everything is, it's a little bit different now, you know? Um, A lot of the communication you get from even just content creators or obviously from gaming sites, it seems like a lot of it is kind of filtered. You know, a lot of people will hide stuff, not give the actual honest opinions about everything. I don't have any uh, allegiances for something like that. So the reason why it's called No Filter is I say what I want when I want I do what I want when I want. And uh, is it ignorant? Possibly. (laughs) You know, it it, it just might be. But I'm not stuck focusing on only certain types of content. I'm not just focusing on the mainstream uh, uh, games out there. I'm not, you know, again, I'm not filtering my opinion on any of these games. And hopefully you guys can appreciate that. And, of course, I'm not paid by any of these companies like a lot of the douchebags out there are that would then, you know, kind of avoid what they're going to be saying and talking about. Not saying all of them are, but that's just kind of how it is. And just with the gaming scene nowadays, I'm also not, you know, just a goddamn hype boy. You know, I I play the games. I'm a, again, I hope that my fresh take on this in podcast format is something that you guys can appreciate and uh, and would support. So, again, if, if, you know, I'd love to be able to hear you guys leaving, uh, see, you you know, you guys leaving comments or anything like that on uh, whether on the YouTube channel or on Twitter or anything like that. I just, it would be great for me to see that I'm not just talking to myself in a room. (laughs) You know, you know, I really want this to be as community based as possible. And again, I really appreciate uh, all the support that you guys have been, have given me so far in the startup to uh, getting to this episode one. So, you know what? I think I, I think I've talked enough about uh, you know the podcast in general. Let's get started with some of the news. First bit of news: Super Mario Serial. So uh, apparently, this is confirmed now with Kellogg's that uh, Mario is having a new amiibo functioning serial coming out. Uh, I believe on December 11th. Apparently, just in the U.S. So. Uh, my Canadian ass ain't going to be able to <laughs> taste this uh, Lucky Charms ripoff or whatever it is. But the interesting part about this cereal is that obviously Super Mario uh, themed, but uh, it has amiibo functionality. And I-, I can already see this going on Amazon, a box of, you know, shitty cereal for 30 bucks, 50 bucks, who knows. But uh, yeah, I- I'm sure that's a big collector's item. And if I found one in the store, I'd be buying that right away just to uh, either just to use the amiibo uh, Maybe I probably wouldn't have the actual cereal itself. It'd probably just be sitting in the box as maybe a collector's item or something. But, uh, you know, this is interesting. It is very cool to see Nintendo really, you know, uh, advertising in, on all fronts this year. Uh, it's complete 180 from what they were doing with the Wii U and, you know, even 3DS, uh, you know, apart from holidays and stuff. So this is really interesting, and I think it's been paying off for Nintendo. And re- really, they, they need to keep going with this because for some reason they just... They took the pedal, you know, they took their foot off the pedal for for the last like five years, really. They really slowed down with any advertising. I, maybe they maybe they're getting cocky and they thought a lot of their advertising would have just been, you know, by word of mouth. But, uh, you know, clearly that really slowed down with how poorly the Wii, uh, Wii U sold and uh, how the Wii uh, kind of died off at the end of its life cycle as well. So I'm glad to see Nintendo really pushing for all this different advertising. And I think Super Mario Cereal is a really great idea. Um, get you know get some Super Mario in the hands of kids again you know I, I always this is something I always wonder with um, you know Nintendo games and how universal they are but you know a lot of the kids that are growing up now they have their cell phones and they have 
you know, all these free games on there that they use and they have all that kind of stuff. So I wonder how Nintendo can reach these, uh, you know, younger, this younger demographic again, because the demographic just gets older and older for them. So again, I'm hoping that uh, this serial maybe helps out with that. All right, next topic is uh, Black Friday. So Black Friday was a, a little while ago. Uh, again, I'm Canadian, so Black Friday isn't wasn't always the biggest thing in Canada. We don't have as crazy of, I guess, deals that you have in the, the States. Uh, ours is mainly for Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas. But uh, yeah, no, so some of the Black Friday deals, particularly for Switch, uh, there was a Xenoverse 2 Um I think that was going for in Canada. I think it was thirty two ninety nine. So I think that was like a twenty four ninety nine or something in the states. Uh, Disgaea five was on sale, but really it was just down to sixty bucks from the original eighty for us Canadians. So uh, FIFA eighteen. I just bringing that up just to let you guys know again. No way in hell am I buying any EA game for uh, for uh, uh, brand new. Anything I'm getting from them is used, and I wouldn't have bought FIFA eighteen anyway. Uh, the other thing I guess I want to bring up is the 2DS Ocarina of Time. Like, what was it, 80 bucks for the 2DS with Ocarina of Time? Like, it's crazy how cheap uh, these, you know, uh, these 3DSs are getting. And, you know, what a deal. Like, imagine that just for, you know, for a kid. Like, you get Ocarina of Time and a 2DS, like, under your tree for Christmas or something like that. You know, that's that's one hell of a deal right there. Especially with the amount of games on that system. It's getting cr- kind of crazy, you know. That's really good, really good deal. Um, but yeah, as far as me, I didn't buy any of those. I wouldn't have bought those games before Disguise five possibly, but, uh, I think I got to wait a little bit, uh, for it to go a little bit, uh, lower in price. Um, the one game I did buy though was for PS4 and I don't even own a PS4 yet, but uh, I bought Dishonored two because Dishonored one on steam was, it's one of my favorite PC games I've played in the longest time fantastic fantastic game and i've been you know and i was looking forward to dishonored 2 for so long so when i found it for 24.99 brand new i had to pick it up all right next bit of news switch selling 3 million in japan in 2017 so uh yeah so this this is that's kind of crazy the switch is just destroying it in japan and uh you know i think everyone knew switch was going to do extremely well in japan being a portable system but uh you know, three million just in 2017 with all the stock issues they've been having, and uh, you know that's really impressive. And just again, think back to the Switch coming out in March. You know, end of 2017, that's not even a full year, and over three million units in Japan. Uh, if if it hits that mark, that is pretty astounding, and uh, you know that's really really impressive. And you know, it's good for Nintendo and good for us. The more Switches it sells, the more games we're going to be able to play. All right, next item is a Nintendo Direct in January. So I believe there was a uh, a, a leaked uh, presentation from uh, Zoink Games or from EA for their new uh, game called Fey, uh, F-E. And apparently uh, there's going to be a new reveal for the game in a Direct in, I believe, January. And then the game's releasing in February. So I think this kind of aligns with all of our thoughts about a Direct in January to start off the new year 2018 and um, you know I feel like a lot of people are looking forward to this Uh, I'm happy that they're not doing anything in December at least I hope they're not doing anything in December they have so many games out right now for the system they really need to just hit home that the all these games are here buy these games right now 2018 leave some of these big surprises for then don't take away the luster of the games that are coming out now because you know, guys, there's still a ton of games coming out in December. I know this, today's December 1st. I just got Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot of other games coming out following this, um, particularly some indies that I've been looking forward to, like the u- uh, ukulele that I've been waiting on. Um, but yeah, Nintendo Direct in January. That's pretty exciting. Uh, next news item and last that I want to talk about on this episode is... Uh, the Game Awards 2017. So I've been following Jeff Keighley on Twitter, my Twitter at Wizrad if you want to follow me. <laughs> so, you know, I've been following him and it seems like there is a lot of work going into this year's Game Awards. And I'm pretty excited to see this because for me, the Game Awards, when it was like the Spikes VGAs or whatever they call it, and, you know, when it was on Spike TV and, and how it has been for honestly the last you know, over a decade, it's been kind of a joke. It's clearly like companies paying for everything. And, you know, the the actual awards are kind of 
again kind of a joke it's just popularity contest nothing that actually has to do with the quality of the game um and uh you know I i'm glad what it seems like they're doing with the game awards 2017 is that they're actually expanding into more world premieres uh you know maybe some maybe some bits that they have going on and uh, some other announcements or they're really just trying to diversify because i feel like they're aware that the game awards themselves like the actual awards aren't you know i think it's more of something that people just have as a list and they see that and then that's all they really care about i don't think anyone really needs to see these big theatrical awards handing out to the developers and stuff like that i feel like that's not what brings people to these and it's more about the actual world premieres of the games and apparently there's going to be quite a bit in uh in this uh this year so i'm looking forward to it um i don't know if i'll watch it live or anything like that but i believe it's on december 7th going through to the 8th so I, again i think it's more of than just a you know a three-hour event apparently it's a full uh, think of like a mini e3 or something where uh, you know jeff Keeley would always be you know he'd be hosting a little show or i think he did youtube live or something like that this year for e3 so anyway i'm looking forward to that i did put in my votes for some of the games uh, i'll talk to you guys about what my game of the year and uh, all that other stuff is later but uh, i think some of you might not be a surprise and some of you actually might be surprised and now here's my next segment and this is going to be talking about two of the games I played on Switch earlier this year. First one being ARMS. Yes. So, again, I just want to kind of go over some of the games I've been playing over the year just to catch you guys up on my Switch activity over the year. And, uh, again, the first one is ARMS. So, just to kind of brief over it, I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on, on these too long. But uh, ARMS, I mained Twintel and Ribbon Girl. And... Uh, you know, Ribbon Girl was nice. I loved having the double jump aspect, but Twin Twel uh, Twintel being able to, well, first off, that ass, you know, but, <laughs> you know, for Twintel, you really had to, you had the, I guess, the freezing mechanic and you can really like hold, you can freeze yourself in the air and then you can really kind of work around people like that. And I thought, I thought it was a lot more strategic in how you maneuvered yourself and uh, you had to be very deliberate in what you were doing. So I, I did really appreciate Twintel, uh, Twintel. Uh, a lot of the other, I played, you know, I played some, uh, 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 uh what's his name? Helix. Uh, yeah. Like I, I have some serious props for whoever can actually play that guy. He is really tough to get used to, but I did have fun trying him, but re you know, really like, you know, I wouldn't win too many times when I was actually playing him, but, uh, it was really fun being able to really stretch out into, you know, really tall and then like avoid someone by like kind of jumping over where their punch would have been or, or, you know, shrinking down to try to avoid a punch that might be angling upwards. Uh, you know, I thought it was a lot of fun like that. Um, as far as the game, I loved the campaign, especially the difficulty. I feel like if it didn't have that difficulty, I wouldn't have enjoyed, I wouldn't have enjoyed it nearly as much as I did. Because really, that the, at the start of the game, the game was kicking my ass quite a little bit. And, uh, you know, I loved having that experience of really developing my skills and really getting better and better and better until, you know, I'm online and I'm you know, I'm holding my own with some of these really talented players. And I think that's something that a lot of people can respect about ARMS is that it is a very skill-based game. I, I feel like a lot of people that when they first saw it, they're thinking, oh, it's just gonna be a waggle, throw as many times as you can. If you do that, you're getting, you're getting dummy like right away. You know, this is a serious competitive game. And I'm really happy that Nintendo did another one of these great new IPs and, uh, and apparently it sold quite well. And I'm really happy for it too. Um, I guess the one main concern I had here is it kind of reminded me of some of the Wii U days where it had a great concept, but I don't think they fleshed it out as much as they did and they didn't put that much effort into the game out of that. So uh, hear me out here. So the campaign, you know, it was just a, like a Grand Prix thing, it had nothing special to it, but these characters have so much, well, well character to them that... I feel like they could have had like a full, you know, voice acted kind of uh, introductions to each of these characters, even if it's just kind of like the punch out on Wii or something like that. But I feel like they just kind of phoned in the game. They, you know, I know they focused on the gameplay part of it and that's fine, but maybe they just needed more time for it to really develop it. But I feel like they could have developed the world around it, the characters, it would have made it a lot more interesting. And again, the characters are so cool. Their designs are fantastic, but you know, but they're just kind of there. There's no you know, there's no um, emotion to them. There's no like development. There's nothing like that. And I feel like they could have done a little bit more with that. Next up is Splatoon 2. So I love it. 
I love the first one, Splatoon 2. It does everything that the first one did better. And, uh, you know, it had a new campaign. It had everything. And, uh, you know, this is a true sequel coming from Nintendo, which is interesting. Because, uh, as you guys know, with a lot of Nintendo's franchises, there's not many sequels that actually come out. You know, uh, I can think of Mario Galaxy 2 and I can think of Splatoon 2. There's not too many others that I can think of off the top of my head here. But, uh, you know, it has the same... Um, uh, game design elements it has all that kind of stuff but it's just improved on the experience in many ways and added some new modes and stuff like that so i have over 100 hours on splatoon 2 for sure and i st i'm still playing it today um, as far as the story mode the story mode was fun i think i i think it was just because of the originality of the first i like that one better and uh, definitely the final boss. I, I thought Splatoon 2 boss, the final boss was fine. It was good. It was fun. And I, I liked the implementation of Callie and Marine and stuff like that. But uh, that final boss on the first Splatoon, man, that, that's still probably one of the best final bosses I've seen Nintendo make in a game. Uh, you know, DJ Octavio, I believe his name was. That was so much fun. It was so epic and it was tough too. That was really like Nintendo flaunting their boss skills. And, I, you know, hopefully they get to make more of those types of bosses for other games like maybe even the next mario game or something because you know to be fair you know even with zelda games mario games they've never had the most in-depth crazy bosses ever uh, they they kind of started up their whole three uh three phase kind of plan and a lot of other developers followed them but you know i feel like they gotta step up with some of their boss uh, developing and you know I, I feel like they can make it a little bit better but anyway that's a little bit of a tangent um as far as the multiplayer, it's a blast. And oh man, look at how, look at how many uh, maps there are now. They just released that Mako Mart the other day. I was playing that. I love that map. I really like that map. That might be one of my favorites in Splatoon, the entire series right now. Um, and they released Black Belly Skate Park, which was one of my favorites from the first Splatoon. And uh, I know they have that new mode coming out. I forget what it's called. There's something about like clams or something like that. Uh, like that. And uh, you know, and you have like a football and you have to like collect these clams and then throw it into the opposing enemy's hoop or something like that. I don't know, man. I'm just excited. It's so cool to see that there's a new mode coming out now. I, you know, I was hoping that Splatoon 2, when it first came out, would have a new mode from the start. But this is like a full second wind here with Splatoon 2. And I know they, they announced they were going to have full two years of uh, free content updates. And uh, man, this game is already just massive. It's a uh, you know, it's a sleeper, it's honestly, it's kind of a sleeper hit on Switch right now. And a lot of people are talking about the Breath of the Wild, or the Xenoblade, or the Super Mario Ga uh, Odyssey. But, uh, you know, Splatoon 2 also came out this year, and that's kind of crazy. And it's really killing it right now with the free updates. Something you don't see much right now. So, it's great to see. This next segment is what I like to call Hot Matches. This is where I select a topic of my choosing, and I go into detail about that topic. So, to start off here, with a bang, Xenoblade Chronicles. As you guys may have known, I recorded this last week, and this is basically me talking about the entire series, from the first on Wii, Xenoblade Chronicles X on Wii U, and my anticipation for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and, and my hype for that game. So, obviously, when you guys are listening to this podcast now, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has already been released. In fact, I have the special disc in, sitting behind me right now. I might actually post some photos. And uh, if you guys if you guys uh, follow me on Twitter, you'll see some photos or maybe even a short unboxing video of what's included. Uh, the art book, the soundtrack, and the steelbook case. Um, by the way, that box looks stunning. Oh my goodness, it looks beautiful. Um, but uh, yeah, so here's the bit that I recorded from last week. And uh, yeah, just me hyping the series. And uh Hopefully next episode I'll have some initial thoughts about Xenoblade Chronicles 2. All I know is this weekend I'm going to be basically a hermit and I'll be playing Xenoblade. I'm anticipating over 20 hours of gameplay just this weekend alone. So yeah, that's going to be fun. But yeah, enjoy. First segment of Hot Matches, we are going to be talking about Xenoblade Chronicles, the entire series. Yes, so this is, as the time of recording, is seven days before the release of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 on December 1st, 2017, and let's get hyped. I'm ridiculously excited for this game, and I still, okay, just seriously, guys, think about this. We didn't even know what the Switch was, technically, January 2017, and here we are, 
December 1st coming up here, and it's releasing a Xenoblade Chronicles sequel. How insane is that? Seriously, think about this. Xenoblade Chronicles X was announced early on in the Wii U's life cycle, right? Everyone's super hyped. That I remember that first trailer, the music. Oh my god, it was so good. That trailer was so epic, but then we waited, what, two, maybe three years until it was finally released? Yet here we are, not even a year after the announcement of this game, and here we are ready to play this game on our Nintendo Switches. Seriously, it's this is insane. I can't wait to play this game. But you know what? Let's step back a little bit now. Xenoblade Chronicles, the very first game, comes out on the Wii. Remember, we weren't even originally supposed to get this game. I think it was first called Monado Beginning of the World, and I think it was localized to Europe and to um, uh, Japan, and North America wasn't even going to get the game for some reason. We had to go through that whole Operation Rainfall business. Do you guys remember Operation Rainfall? Pandora's Tower, Last Story, Xenoblade Chronicles? I'm so happy that we did that. I feel like Operation Rainfall and really Xenoblade Chronicles and how well it sold on the Wii was one of the big major steps in Nintendo really modernizing their business and actually bringing out games that they assume wouldn't sell or do well in North America and here we are now with Nintendo releasing pretty much every game they make almost even universal um, uh, dates like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 it's going to be released in all regions at the same date, December 1st. How crazy is that? This is complete 180 from the Nintendo of back then when before the Operation Rainfall business. And I feel like a lot of that, again, has to do with Xenoblade and how well it performed, how well it was received by everybody, extremely high rated. And again, it's a masterpiece in my opinion. It's my favorite Wii game. It's my favorite uh, uh, RPG of all time. It is... I, I'm so happy with where the Xenoblade Chronicles series has come from, and it all started from this fantastic game here. And uh, some of the points that I kind of want to make about Xenoblade Chronicles, the music, oh my goodness, the music was incredible. Just amazing. Like I remember I made uh, some of my old content. I did a top 10 Xenoblade Chronicles songs. Um, here's some of them. Thoughts to a Friend. Do you guys remember that? Central Factory. Impatience Mechanical Rhythm. That's everyone's, uh, that's the, the popular favorite from everybody. Engage the Enemy. Oh my god, so epic. Um, I highly suggest you guys go to uh, Nintendo's YouTube channel just to get, just get pumped up again. They had uh, Engage the Enemy live, a live recording of it. Oh, it's, it sounds even better live. Holy shit, guys. It sounds so good. But uh, yeah, so I, I'm actually going to play one of the songs here, actually. So enjoy this. The setting so that's probably the biggest draw I had for the original game was the setting so you're on top two titanic gods you know the Bionis and the Mechonis what how cool is that setting how like like you don't get stuff like that like anywhere else you know you're literally living colonies on like the arm of the Bionis the leg torso everything like that the head of the Mechonis you know you travel across the two with a sword that's been like, you know, like slashed and stabbed into the guy's side. Like, like it's such a cool setting and the scale of everything is just 
crazy and how you're say you're you're running on by honest light you can like look up and you'd see like the arm reaching out and you can always kind of place yourself on the body of these gods that you're living on and all these colonies and it's again like Tetsuya Takahashi and Monolith Soft have always created some of the most amazing beautiful game worlds like with Baton Kaidos back in the day but I think they really outdid themselves with the first Xenoblade Chronicles, and I, I still I'm still in awe about it today. Just it was such a fantastic idea, and um, you know I'm really excited for where they're going to go with this because Xenoblade Chronicles X, where it wasn't as imaginative in that way, the landscapes and everything they built up were just crazy. But I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, as far as the story for Xenoblade Chronicles, again I don't want to like spoil it. Hopefully everyone's played it. You know it's been a while, but really even if it's been even if it's like a 10 year old game i'm not i don't want to spoil this for anybody it's a game everyone should play but you know they get you interested in the story right away with the fiora and the shulk and you guys know kind of what happened with metal face and uh you know it, it instantly hooks you and then the story just builds and builds and builds and wraps everything up in like a beautiful bow at the end everything the story was so incredibly crafted um something that i, I feel like any sequel to that game has a tough time to try to catch up to that. So we'll see how Xenoblade Chronicles 2 does. But uh, again, the first game, wow, that story was incredible. It's, you know, it hooks you right from the start and you just really, you love the characters, you want to go through with everything. And it, you know, it was just great. Uh, as far as the battle system goes, you know, it definitely could have been improved a little bit, but I did love the mix of the turn-based the time based and the and the real you know real action kind of a system where you're moving around constantly you're positioning yourself but then it's also a time like turn based kind of a battle system and uh, it, it added so much layers and a very deep battle system and a lot of people would probably play through the game without actually touching every part of the battle system or part of the game that can really you know the enhance your experience it was just so much and uh, I, I feel like that's a staple for a lot of the Xenoblade games. Okay, so now on to Xenoblade Chronicles X. This released on the Wii U, obviously. Uh, again, I, I brought up before that we had that amazing first trailer. You guys don't know how hyped I was. The music, holy shit. Hiroyuki Sawano, I believe you pronounce it. Uh, the guy who does like Attack on Titan and stuff. My goodness, that intro music with like the choir. Ho -ho -y -ho -y -ho -y -y Oh, it, I was so hyped from that trailer and the fact that we had to wait like what was it two and a half three years something like that oh that was just oh that was so painful but uh honestly when I first played the game I never played a game like it uh, I never had so many like kind of like emotions and okay I don't know about emotions but like you know I never experienced something quite like that before where it really was so truly open but it, it's not just about being an open game it was more about how everything is kind of built in the game the game world and you know that the fact that you see like these level 90 you know you know dinosaurs basically walking right by you right from the very start of the game there's nothing quite like it and the build up about the whole you know the aliens destroying the, the human uh, the the white whale and crash landing on this planet and you know you're trying to build it up but then you're also in a time crunch because your, your whole human race could go extinct you know it was such a cool setting that really the again like the opening 20 hours or so of this was the most memorable and um, awe-inspiring kind of moments I've ever had in games, in in my opinion. Um, the opening 20 hours, just, you know, having everything down to the human scale and you having to run, jump, and hide from larger enemies or attack these other ones, but then having some difficulty even with some smaller enemies until you really build yourself up. It was so incredible, and just the exploration part of it was amazing. I loved it. Um, and then again, like at 50 hours in when you get the mech, it again like opens it up with for another like 10, 15 hours of me just in absolute gaming heaven. That's something that even, like, even with Breath of the Wild in its own way, it was a little bit different. I don't think even that really reached the exact point that I had with Xenoblade Chronicles X. Um, as far as the story and the setting, again, like the setting is really great. I love the setting and the, you know, the concept of the story the overarching story I like a lot, but 
you know, it lost a lot of the character development and interesting things when you had your own NPC kind of a thing. It was a little bit different, and I, I guess I didn't appreciate that as much as uh, I guess some people might have. But, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that the story isn't nearly as developed as it was in Chronicles. But at, at the same time, even just reading developer uh, interviews and stuff, it wasn't supposed to be. You know, it, it was never supposed to be. And again, I, I think trying to follow up one of the best stories ever told in games, you know, that's a that's kind of tough. And I think, yeah, I think they did like a, had a good idea at the end, you know, looking back at it to really separate itself from what Xenoblade Chronicles was. And that's why... I'm pretty excited for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to see where they can kind of improve on that type of a fully detailed uh, story that they did with the first game. Uh, I guess one thing I want to talk about for the two games, uh, the first one, it was, you know, wherever you can see, you can go, you can touch. And that was pretty much true for the entire first game. But with Xenoblade Chronicles X, they took that to a whole new level. And you guys all know what I'm talking about with at first you're climbing all these cliffs, you're doing these crazy moon jumps, and it was so, you had so much freedom in the world, which is, you know, really liberating, and that's something that Monolith Soft does really well, and then they give you a mech, <laughs> you know, you can literally fly as high as you can possibly go into the sky and just drop, you know, like, you can do anything, whenever, wherever, and um, again, that's something that you don't see in games too often, and uh, I think these re truly were one of the first games at least with nintendo that are really pushing for this open world and they clearly had a huge impact on how nintendo developed zelda breath of the wild um i guess what i did want to talk about as well was the music uh mono x really good primordia uh, mira theme uh, again i'm gonna play one of the songs here for you guys but uh black tar as well there's a lot of great music here here yuki swano again he's fantastic for this type of epic scale uh, and uh, i know a lot of people didn't like the new la song i thought it was pretty interesting i, I didn't mind it but yeah i did play a little bit too often because you'd have to go back to the city it'd be nice if they filtered that out a little bit so we'll see how they kind of de deal with that in xenoblade chronicles 2 but i have a feeling like you won't be going back to the same city so often as you did in xenoblade chronicles x it's like the main hub it'll be more like xenoblade chronicles where you're going through you know, village, city, town, all this, all this different kind of stuff in a row. But yeah, again, definitely one of the best Wii U games. And uh, I, I still just remember when I first got it, I, I would take days off from my, uh, from school, from uni. I would take off a full day. I would basically just sit there. I'd get like a bag of chips. You know, I'd be like the biggest slob ever. And I would just completely uh, invest my like entire being into this game. Um, <laughs> you know, like I remember I take so many screenshots on Miiverse because everything was so breathtaking to me and me for how much I love Miiverse. Oh, I was a pain taking screenshots. The switch is a godsend for screenshots. I'm telling you, I take so many and before with Miiverse, you'd have to wait for it to load. You have to do the screenshot. It takes another loading time and you have to exit it takes more loading time. And it's, it was a huge pain, but, uh, again, I'm so excited for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 with it. Um, last kind of thing I want to talk about was Xenoblade Chronicles 3D. I do have the game, but I haven't actually played it all the way through on the 3DS yet. I've played, I think I've started up twice, and I played maybe like five hours, and then there's other games that are new that I want to play, and then by the time that I was, I had the time, I've played most of the RPGs in my backlog, and I was ready to play Xenoblade Chronicles uh, on th uh, 3D. Then Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was announced, and then I didn't want to like burn myself out with Xenoblade just before playing uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, so I ended up uh, holding off, and I will be playing that maybe a year after I beat Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and uh, just kind of look back on it there, and uh, kind of compare the two from that end, so you guys will probably hear about that in the podcast at some point. And now, my thoughts about Xenoblade Chronicles 2, in a, in a word, HYPE! Holy crap, 7 days people seven days by the time you're listening this is probably gonna be six maybe five heck it's probably gonna be out but uh again I, i'm so excited i haven't been paying too much attention to all the announcements i have watched pretty much everything they've released about it in the directs and all that kind of stuff but i, I try not to digest too much i just kind of look at how like what it is some of the, the settings but i don't try to listen to too much of i want to learn the whole battle system with how the game is i want to kind of develop from there um the music returning, the artists are returning from the first game. So I believe it's like Ace, uh, 
I don't know if Yoko Shimamura is coming back. Uh, I forget if she uh, is coming back or not for a couple songs. I'm not sure, but uh, they're they're all back in here, and uh, you know I can't be more excited for that. Um, oh, and Switch is a handheld device. Oh, I'm gonna be. I'm going to be playing for, okay, for the weekend. It's coming out on Friday. I Sadly, I can't get that day off of work for that day. Got a, got some stuff going on on the Friday. So Friday night all the way through till Monday, I am going to be a complete slob, just 100% of my time into Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And uh, it being on a handheld as well on TV, obviously. Um, again, godsend. Absolutely love it. Can't wait. Um I'm excited, I guess, about the face models. Uh, I think everyone always kind of realized that the first Xenoblade, the face models were okay, but yeah, they were a little bit wonky. Xenoblade Chronicles X really kind of put some weird Uncanny Valley kind of a, a spin on them, and, you know, I was definitely not a fan of them. <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit creepy at times, but, you know, they did the job, and everything else looked so gorgeous. Who actually really paid attention to any face? And uh, I guess the last thing I really want to talk about was the Titans. The Titans. Oh, my goodness. So, so you know how excited I was about Bionis and Mechonis. Uh, I, I can't imagine these Titans are as large as each one of those individually. But, man, there's, like, what, like, over a dozen Titans that you're, like, that have all these different colonies on them. It's going to be so, such a variety of locales. I I am so excited for this. You know, whereas Xenoblade Chronicles X, it was, you know, the world was so massive but it really was just the i was at the five or the six different locales that you had so you know it was like the 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 wildlife area the the swampy area the desert the the fire area the ice area you know whereas this one they're gonna have so many different uh titans to go on in different locales that i just can't wait to see what creativity they kind of come up with here so um that's that's pretty much it guys I, i didn't have much else i really wanted to go over I didn't want to really spoil too much, but, you know, hype for Xenoblade Chronicles, guys. Like, this is an important kind of gaming milestone, at least in my opinion here. Uh, this is going to be something for the ages, for, for the pretty much the Switch's life cycle. I can just imagine that this is going to be one of the top games released, um, hopefully. You know, hopefully they don't screw it, screw it up, but uh, let's not be so pessimistic here. Um, I am, you know, I, again, I'm incredibly excited for this, and I hope you guys are too. But let's get going on the next segment here. and final segment of no filter in nintendo podcast episode one is something i like to call the no filter rant this is basically me finding something that's annoying me in the gaming industry nowadays and just ranting about it for a little while uh you guys some of you guys might find this familiar for some of my past content i've created so let's get started so i've been following this guy who's actually a journalist for kotaku which is really really odd because i've never cared for kotaku I, I feel like most of what they do is just clickbaity and just really kind of terrible content <laughs> like just it's really one of the worst gaming sites in my opinion but um for some reason you know this they seem to have this relatively good gaming journalist uh he's been following a lot of the star wars battlefront uh two loot box issues and he even like discovered that someone was faking being an ea employee and you know, he, he discovered that and he had some really cool articles about it. So I was like, you know what? This guy seems like a cool dude. I, you know, I could have some really cool um, uh, topics to bring up from him uh, in the No Filter and Nintendo podcast. So, you know, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to follow this guy. And, uh, and you know, I, I didn't expect that the first <laughs> topic that I get from this guy's uh, from this guy's work is actually a review he does for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So... A little bit today, I started looking into kind of what he's done on Kotaku and, uh, you know, his opinion on Xenoblade Chronicles. And, um, yeah, his review was 
really kind of terrible. And I, this kind of brought up my whole topic here, which is about how game sites choose which person to review a game and which person should be reviewing games. Um, let me let me kind of you know I'll go into more detail here. So um, yeah, so this review from the this guy Jason Schreier. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, it was incredibly negative. The entire thing, you can tell right from the start, this guy had like a chip on the shoulder or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so it was a really, honestly, like just read the review. It was really just kind of terrible. Uh, if you want to cringe, read it. it. It's just, it was such bullshit. And like, Okay, again, I'll get into that after, but it was just such bullshit. So I go back, I look at his other review where he did of, uh, or, well, not his other review, but I, I went and looked, and yeah, apparently he also did not like the first Xenoblade Chronicles. So that kind of has me thinking. Why have a reviewer who didn't like the first game in the series review the second one? Um, I understand that there might be, hey, well, what improvements did they do on the first one? But that's not something you need someone who hated the series to begin with to um you know to to review and tell you that would be something that anyone whether a fan or just a general person could be saying hey you know what they improved on it this way they improved on it this way they did this this way you didn't need him for something like that but where i'm kind of getting kind of annoyed with here is that you know again he did not like the first game in the series so why have him be the one reviewing the next one what one um one analogy kind of thing that one metaphor that I would kind of use is basically me saying, Hey, if I hate soccer and my site told me, Hey, you need to review FIFA for us. Is that fair to do? Should I be the one reviewing FIFA? Even though I already have this predetermined bias against the sport as a whole or the, the topic or whatever it is of that game, you know, is that is that a fair thing to do? Should I be the one reviewing that? And should it be welcomed with open arms from everybody saying it's his opinion, so that should be the one reviewing it? You know, that, that's like a gen, genu, uh, genuine question because, no, you don't. maybe you don't want just fans to review games because that would mean only the fans would be reviewing it and they already have a relatively positive opinion about that type of game. But that also means that they understand where that game sits in the sphere of what that game is or that genre of game you know what i mean whereas if you bring a guy who didn't like the one beforehand into reviewing this one you're almost guaranteed to get a negative review on it and but here's the thing it's not because it was just he didn't like the first game it's because he didn't like the first game that was critically acclaimed that was just acclaimed to be a fantastic game by 99 percent of people out there if it was a sequel to troll and i and he didn't like the first troll and i that is genuinely generally known by everybody that is not a great game that is not a good game so having him review the sequel is not that big of an issue but again for a considered by many including me as one of the best jrpgs of all time the first game that he doesn't like and they bring him in to review the sequel something's off there something is not right with doing that and again it brings me to the whole analogy hey i don't like soccer am i going to review fifa hey i hate call of duty you're going to make me review call of duty uh, uh world war ii fuck no you're not going to do that but here we are i see on his twitter he does these posts about um he had a post about these people saying hey why are you reviewing the game you know obviously he's going to get backlash about a critically acclaimed sequel to a game that he didn't like yet why is he the one reviewing it? obviously there's going to be backlash there but all of a sudden i go on his i read down the comments of all this stuff and you see all these other fucking game journalist reviewers going there saying like yeah solidarity brother fuck these guys say you can't have an opinion it's like no you can have a fucking opinion no one cares it, it, it's your opinion it doesn't fucking matter you have an opinion it's fine there's no issue with that the issue comes from the reason why are you the one reviewing the game if you already have that predetermined negativity towards it. Again, seriously, guys, look at his review. Just read the fucking thing. It is ridiculous. Just the entire time, the tone, the negatives, never bringing up a positive for something here or doing this here. I'm sure I can guarantee if I went into more detail about some of the other JRPGs he's probably looked at, he wouldn't bring up a damn thing about stuff that he is doing for this review here. So... Clearly, this guy, okay, also, go on either to his Twitter or on to Kotaku or whatever it is to actually see 
the headlines for this stuff. And maybe this is just a normal Kotaku thing, but man, they love to just get the clickbait going. And uh, you know, and this is what's kind of disappointing me here is that the guy seemed like a genuinely good gaming journalist, but then I see him doing this kind of clickbait stuff, and it just, I'm like, man, like, where's the gaming journalist? Like, they've just gone down the toilet. I don't know. It's it, it's just really annoying me for that. And um, I guess one argument that some people could have would be that, you know, the people who have never played the games before, so they want to see someone who has an opinion that who hasn't been into the series or that isn't already a fan, and yeah, then they can get someone who actually is like that. But not being a fan of the series is not the same as not playing the series. You know, if they want to have an opinion, they don't want one that's already starting negative. Sure, they might not want one that's already extremely positive about the series. You know, like my opinion, my or my uh, my bias of really loving the first one. Well, to be fair, that could negatively affect it because I have such a high anticipation, or it could be possibly affecting it because I already enjoy that type of game. But again. If you want to have a clean slate opinion about it for someone who's never played the games, you shouldn't be going to a person who doesn't like the series in the first place. That's not the same. Not being a fan of a series is not the same as not playing the series. Sure, they are both aren't fans, one because they just didn't like the game, or one because they haven't played it yet, but there's a distinct difference there, and that is something that not everyone's catching in these conversations. Um, it's also different when he's one of the few who didn't like um, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles the original. Again, critically highly regarded game. So why is he the one reviewing it? Like, like I don't know. That's that's what kind of gets me. Those two points there. It's like why this guy? But yeah, it's like the it's the constant negativity, and then they use those like the very descriptive paragraph of negative words to put that as like the clickbait article title that everyone's going to see other sites will pick up saying oh well look at this guy he said this about this game it's like they're just using this as clickbait titles just for clicks and then but then again the the thing that really annoys me here which is almost a little bit of a tangent but i'm going to go into it anyway these fucking these other reviewers that they're out there they're trying to they come into these things and try to support this guy basically saying oh yeah fuck these people for saying you can't have an opinion man you know this is the worst you know i have to deal with this all the time with my reviews blah 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 it's like fuck off with this minority group bullshit that you guys are doing go fuck yourselves seriously this opinion shit has to kind of stop everyone no shit everyone has an opinion and one of my favorite things here is i'd like to say hey the last of us is the piece of sh- the most piece of shit puzzle game I've ever seen in my life. No one should ever play this game. Fuck it. Hey, whoa, 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 guys! It's my opinion, though. It's my opinion. There's not. It's not. It's my opinion. You can't say anything about it. It's my opinion. Hey, you guys can. You can't. Don't. Don't criticize what I'm saying. It's just my opinion. It doesn't fucking work like that, people. And and you're trying to minority group yourselves and saying, oh, you know, we're attacked because we just have our opinions. No, it's not about your fucking opinions. It's about the context around it, how it's how it's coming to that. It's you guys are a bunch of dumb fucking white knights with this opinion stuff, and the opinion stuff's just got to stop. I feel like that's got to be just another rant at another at another date. But again, it's just not you know having an opinion is it's just that it's an opinion, but it doesn't mean that that is something that's you know like religious and you can't really talk about it. That doesn't make any sense. But yeah, I don't know. It's just. It's just disappointing, you know, I was looking forward to seeing some more of the guy's content. Uh, knowing me, I'll probably still follow him a little bit here, but, you know, it's just disappointing to see just this clickbait and, like, just the constant negativity that isn't, doesn't seem warranted. Obviously, I haven't played the game yet, but just reading how it is, the tone of the review and everything like that, and then comparing that to something else, clearly he wasn't giving it a fair shot. And, uh, again, whether it's for clickbait and clicks, I guess that's just a Kotaku thing. But, uh, you know, it's it's just frustrating to see that, especially when, I guess, he's selected from Kotaku to review that game. And, you know, it's just, you know, I guess it's just disappointing. I don't know. Um, yeah, I've been talking enough for that. And uh, I'm sure I can have another rant about the, the White Knights talking about opinions, opinions. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's it. That's the end of No Filter and Nintendo Podcast, Episode 1. Um I guess what I wanted to bring up here is just going forward the podcast. So I am planning for this podcast to be a weekly deal. Um, I'm still determining the best day for me to upload. 
my schedule does vary quite a bit with work and whatever I'm doing, so it might not be as consistent as I want, but I will be um, posting content weekly going forward, and uh, hopefully I can keep up with that. I do plan on having lots of variety in this. Uh, to start off, at least here, I'm going to have quite a few top 10s or 20s talking about games that I um, I've always enjoyed. I always like watching other people's top tens and seeing kind of what games kind of develop their gaming uh, landscape and what they what they like. And it usually gives me some good ideas of games I need to try out as well. So that's something I want to do. Uh, I want to have some user questions. It'd be great if you guys could uh, send any questions either in the comments or on in my on my Twitter and email anything like that. I, I would really appreciate some questions. I do plan on having some guests and, uh, you know, guests on the podcast. It it doesn't have to be some big, huge content creators. I just want to have other gamers on here that we can really talk about actual games, you know, and that's something that I feel like is missing in the gaming landscape nowadays. It seems so, uh, you know, mainstream now where it's not really getting into the grittiness of each game. It's just so monopolized now. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but you know, I'm hopefully, hopefully that's something a lot of you guys can look forward to. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So I just want to say thank you guys for listening. Um, please, uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel, No Filter, a Nintendo podcast. Um, uh, follow me on Twitter at Wizrad. That is W-I-Z-R-A-D. And if you, ha- again, if you have any questions or any comments you want to bring to me directly, uh, my email is nofilter underscore Wizrad at hotmail.com. And that is it for episode one. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and I will see you guys in the next episode.